Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new episode of Ask Huda, where I'll try to answer the questions that you either send by emails or ask by calling through the direct lines. And just before going to the questions that were sent by emails, it's just a reminder that more than one-third of this blessed month has gone. So 12 days are gone from Ramadan. And the countdown is on. And each and every individual of us must audit the previous period. Every one of us should try to check in the good deeds that he had stored in them and of the bad deeds that he indeed had committed in them. Twelve days. How many times have you finished reciting the Quran? I know people that have finished four times reciting the whole Quran. Every three days, they finish it once. How much did you spend in the cause of Allah, in means of charity, in means of feeding the poor and the hungry, giving money to the needy? How many rak'ahs did you miss throughout these 12 days with the congregation? Or should I say how many prayers? Subhanallah. These days are gone from our lives. There is no way, there is no possibility for us to get them back again. So do not do the same mistake in the remaining 18 days. Do not be negligent, do not be ignorant, and start to work through the things that Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with and stay away from the things that angers Allah the Almighty. And by this you would be utilizing your life, your time, utilizing this blessed month to the full. Our first, que first question is from Sister Paula, and she's from Belgium. She sent me two questions, and the first one says that she has a daughter who got married to a non-Muslim, and she has a child from this non-Muslim. And she is so attached to her granddaughter, she loves her so much. Yet her husband detests the whole issue and he refuses to look at her, he refuses to treat his daughter well, and she is saying that this daughter, this young child, has no fault in coming into this world. So she's asking for advice. First of all, this is one of the problems that face Muslim parents living in the West. And this is inevitable. Unless they do something about it, unless the Muslim community act, then this is going to continue, and may Allah have mercy upon us all. Muslims living in non-Muslim non countries should try their level best to bring up their children in an Islamic environment in the sense that they should not send them to mixed schools or mixed universities and then hope that nothing happens. It is difficult. This is human nature. When you put fuel next to the fire, it's going to ignite. Therefore, it is the responsibility of every Muslim, every individual living in non-Muslim countries to try and work with the community 
to have an Islamic environment. Now, Sister Paula says that her daughter got married to a non-Muslim man. This is not a marriage. This is fornication. There isn't any such contract as marriage between a non-Muslim man and a Muslim woman. So this is not marriage. It is void. It has no value at all. The child is born out of wedlock. So he is not to be called after his so-called biological father because he is not his actual and legitimate father. And if the daughter, if your daughter believes that this is marriage and it is halal and there is nothing wrong in getting married to a non-Muslim man, then she has nullified her Islam and she is not a Muslim anymore. Because this is something that Allah stated in the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ instructed us with and also the consensus of scholars that it is not permissible for a Muslim woman to get married to a non-Muslim man. Any religion he is following, it is forbidden unless he is a Muslim. Your husband's standpoint is correct. If his daughter is fornicating and living in uh, uh, such a relationship which is adultery, which is illegitimate, the least he could do is show his discontent, his detestment to what is going on, rather than treating her as nothing has happened, as if it's a difference of opinion. No, this is not the case. It is a crucial thing. It is one of the major sins in Islam. Therefore, you should, good, you should give sincere advice to your daughter that she should separate from this man. There is nothing wrong in loving the child. This young granddaughter of yours, it, she is your granddaughter. And you have to give her all the love and care and compassion you can. But your daughter who is in a relationship, in a forbidden relationship with this man, should be reprimanded and she should not be treated easily in the sense that it's okay whether you drink soft drinks or you drink water. It's, it's the same thing. No, this is a serious sin. At least you should not allow her to come in the house. This man who is in a relationship with her is not related to you, so you do not treat him as a son-in-law. He is a non-Muslim and he is a fornicator and therefore you should not uh, uh, take this matter easily. Her second question is that she has a son and her son is interested in marrying a Christian woman. So she's asking, uh, um, is it permissible for him to marry her before she accepts Islam? And this is a misconception. When a person wants to marry a Christian woman, he thinks that it is mandatory that she accepts Islam so that he could marry her. And that is why we find a lot, and I mean a lot, of marriages that the women pretend to embrace Islam for the sake of the marriage contract. So they declare, now I'm a Muslim, I've changed my name from so and so into an Arabic or an Islamic name, and they get married. But she's not accepting Islam. She's not embracing it. She is not practicing it. She does not believe in it. And this is a major problem because if the marriage contract took place while she is pretending to be a Muslim and we discover that she's not, then the marriage contract is void. Because she is a Muslim, she pretended to be a Muslim and then she committed an act of apostasy. She rejected Islam. And a Muslim can only marry a Muslim woman, a Christian woman, or a Jew. So if a woman commits the act of apostasy, then she's not a Muslim anymore, and hence the marriage contract is not uh, valid and it's not acceptable. But if the woman wants to be, remain and still be a Christian, marrying her is permissible in Islam. A man, a Muslim man, can marry a Christian lady, providing that he, she is uh, preserving her chastity, she is not 
going out and flirting with men and having relationships like a lot of the marriages take place. A lot of the boys get girlfriends for three, four years and then decide to marry them. They are not in the state of chastity and therefore it is not permissible for you to marry such a woman. You're allowed to marry a Christian woman if she is preserving herself and not being so-called slut. Likewise, it's permissible for you to marry a Muslim woman if she is not going astray. But if you find a woman who has relationships and who uh, plays around and you want to marry her, this is forbidden because she has to be preserving and keeping her chastity. Therefore, it is okay and permissible, inshallah, for uh, your son to marry this Christian woman, though it is not recommended. And why do we say it's not recommended, though it's permissible? Because you would like to bring your children up in the same level and on the same thinking. So, if you're a Muslim and she's a Muslim, the children would be brought up as Muslims. They would not have any conflicts. But if she is a Christian, she would, she would continue to try and influence her children to her religion. Maybe not as much, but she would always have this influence. So you'd rather have one, marry one that shares your religion, that knows your culture, that knows how to treat your parents and your uh, uh, siblings and your family as well. I believe that we have uh, Saad from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, sir? Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. My question is, uh, in a non uh, in a non Arabic Muslim, okay, uh, uh, people are uh, reading Quran and uh, they are not understand, but they are uh, uh, following Islam and praying and all. Okay, if they get up and uh, what happen if they don't understand Quran but they still they are reading? Okay. Any on this? Okay. Any any more questions? No. Zakallah khair, brother Saad. Thank you, brother Saad. And this is a beautiful name, Saad. It's very rare that you fee, uh, find people calling their children Saad. Saad is one of the prominent names among the scholars. Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, Saad ibn Ubada, Saad ibn Mu'adh and all these great companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Anyhow, his question was, in or for a person who does not know Arabic. Now, he prays and he recites the Qur'an, but he is unable to understand the Qur'an. So is he rewarded for that? And the answer was from the Prophet ﷺ. He told us that with every letter, Allah would multiply the reward by 10, which means that if you recite Alif, Lam, Mim, these are three letters. This is not one letter. So Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, Mim is a letter, and Allah would give you with each letter 10 good deeds. So the more you recite, the more good deeds you get. The Prophet did not mention anything about understanding yet. So, for those who know how to read Arabic, if they read it and they do not understand it, Allah Azza wa Jal would reward them for that. And, and, and He would do that a lot. 1 to, to 10 and 10 to 700 good deeds with each and every letter. Now, if you understand it, this is even better for your reward. However, those who do not uh, understand what they're reading or those who do not even know how to read Arabic because there are Muslims who are unable to read the Ar Arabic script. So for those, we highly encourage them to learn Arabic because this would be a form of transformation. This would be a transformation from Ignorance to knowledge. People play around with you like a football because you do not know Arabic. Once you know Arabic and you can read the Quran and you can read the Hadith, you can hold me accountable to what I say and say, Sheikh, where did you get this from? And I tell you it's in volume so-and-so, page so-and-so. 
but without knowing the language, you have to find someone whom you trust and follow him in whatever he says. Therefore, if you know Arabic, but you don't understand, Allah will reward you for that. If you don't know Arabic, and you do not understand what is being said to you, you have to go and re refer to the commentary or the translation of the meaning of the Holy Quran. And by doing this, Allah knows that this is the best of your ability. Allah Azza wa Jal would reward you for that, inshaAllah. I believe that we have Brother Samir from Jeddah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, yes, brother. Uh, how are you, sir? I'm fine, Zakallah Khair. Alhamdulillah. Sir, I have a question which is uh, basically uh, we all believe that life and death is pre predetermined, as in pre written uh, by Allah in our nasib. Uh, what happens to people who, uh, who are killed prematurely in the form of, let's say, a terrorist attack or somebody murders somebody? Uh, I have two questions relating to this. One is, uh, is that person destined to die this way? Okay. And, and secondly, if uh, the person who's killing the other person is, if, you know, if he's part of the whole scheme of Allah being, you know, if his life, if his death is written this way, uh, uh, how is he, uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, just a little confusion on this uh, topic, so if you can elaborate. Why, why is the confusion, uh, Brother Samir? Okay, I think... Uh, we've been cut off. Brother Samir is asking about the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal and the preordination of things. We believe that Allah Azza wa Jal wrote everything that is going to happen until the day of judgment and that was 15,000 years before he created his creation. In the authentic hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when Allah created the pen, He told it, write. And the pen said, what should I write? And Allah told the pen to write everything that's going to happen from now until the day of judgment. The Prophet says, this was 50,000 years before, before Allah created the creation. So we believe that Allah Azza wa has preordained everything that is happening now. Now, to believe in destiny... It's a critical issue because a lot of the people seem to think of Allah Azza wa Jal as their peers and hence they would think that, oh, this is unfair. This is injustice. How would Allah Azza wa Jal make us do such horrible things? Well, first of all, you have to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal is fair and just. This goes without questioning. Allah the Almighty said in the authentic hadith, the hadith of Qudsi, that I have made zulm, which is uh, a aggression and transgression, I've made that forbidden upon myself. And hence it is forbidden upon all of you. So do not wrongdo each other. So this is number one. Number two, we have to believe in the wisdom of Allah and the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal. It is not like my knowledge and yours. A teacher could say that his student is going to flunk and to fail next year's test. Now he is not unfair, he is not unjust, but he knows the capability of his student. Allah Azza wa Jal's knowledge is higher and Allah has the highest example, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not compared to such an example. But this you have to understand and believe that his knowledge, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is unlike any other knowledge. So for, to answer your question, is it written at the side of Allah that this victim would be killed? The answer is yes. Is it written at the side of Allah that this murderer would kill? The answer is yes. Then one may assume the hypothetical question, why would Allah then punish the murderer if it was already written? Well, this is the one million dollar question. How did the murderer know that Allah would write this on him? Does he know the unseen? Does he know the future? No. He said, yes, but Allah Azza wa wrote that I would kill that person. And now he's punishing me for that. It's like a man who stole at the time of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. And they brought him. And Umar told him, why did you steal? 
He said, O Khalifa of the Muslims, O Caliph, it's something that Allah Azza wa Jal wrote upon me. And Umar said, well, Allah wrote upon us to chop your hand off. And he did this as a punishment, prescribed punishment. Now, the murderer who killed and is complaining about destiny, we would tell him, please go to a high riser of 80 floors high and jump from the ceiling and let us see. If it's distant that you will fall on your feet unharmed, alhamdulillah. But if you die, this is your destiny. Would he do that? Definitely not. Then why? Because he chose to go to the high riser. He chose to kill. And Allah Azza wa Jal knew what he is going to do. And that is why Allah is going to hold him accountable. We have a caller from uh, uh, Muhammad from uh, Jeddah, I believe. Assalamu alaikum. Or Mr. Alaykum. Mahmoud. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, uh, how are you, Sheikh? I have one question. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm caught uh, the Holy Quran without uh, abusion. What do you see about abusion? I, I did not understand your question. Again, please. Thank you, Alhamdulillah. No, no, I did not understand your question. Can you repeat it okay. again? Uh, I'm, I'm caught the, the Holy Quran without uh, abusion, Sheikh. Ah, you, you hold the Qur'an without wudu? Yeah. Okay, I'll answer this, inshallah. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. Alaykum as to Allah. I believe uh, I will answer Brother Mahmoud's question, just inshallah, after the break, so stay tuned. to Ramadan in focus. I'm Yusuf Estes. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, you can appreciate the subject of Ramadan. As we say in Texas, get the hay down where goats can eat it, you know. Totally and completely all mercy. If there is mercy, must be coming from a Rahman. How much? 99 times all of the mercy that's ever been shown in this universe is going to be shown to the believers on that day. And certainly we will need it. Isn't that the truth? Look, this is from the mercy, the Rahmah of Allah. So it's always a responsibility of Muslims to make sure the right message gets out. But it's also our responsibility to listen to those in authority over us. The entire staff at Hoda would like to wish you a wonderful and blessed Ramadan. All the prophets are brothers and they uh, represent the same message. What was the call of the prophet? What was his invitation? He was inviting, inviting to what? So the Prophet said, O oh Allah, grant your mercy. And the one who is tolerant if he, you know, if he sails. And one who is tolerant if he buys. And one who is tolerant when he seeks his rights. Try to discipline them in the best way. Those daughters will be his shield. That means those will be the reason, the cause of his protection from hellfire because of what taking care of him. what you have in this life no matter what you have is less and it is temporary the entire staff at hoda would like to wish you a wonderful and blessed ramadan and welcome back. So, Brother Samir from Jeddah, the confusion that he's getting, that he does not understand how would Allah Azza wa Jal 
allow this to happen, thinking that this is unfair and unjust from Allah. No, this is not the, the case. First of all, you have to believe that we all belong to Allah in the sense that if Allah decided to annihilate the whole population and destroy the whole universe, who would dare and say, this is not right? It's Allah's. He has the right to do whatever He wishes. But He told us that He does not do any injustice to people. Allah gave us the will and Allah gave us the vision to choose right from wrong. And He told us that He's going to account to hold us accountable for what we choose. And there are four pillars for destiny that you have to believe in. First of all, you have to believe that Allah knows everything. So knowledge is the first thing. Allah knows what had taken place and what is taking place at the moment and what will take place in the future and what did not take place in the future, how would it would have been material, uh, materialized if it had taken place. The second pillar of believing in uh, uh, preordination or in the destiny is that you have to believe that Allah had written it down. So it is all written down in the preserved tablet. And this was 50,000 years ago. The third pillar is that Allah Azza wa Jal intended that. Though Allah Azza wa Jal allows things that He does not approve of religiously, but he approves of it as it's taking place. Allah Azza wa wants from the whole humanity to believe in the Quran and in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of them do, some of them don't. Those who don't, though they go against Allah's will, but Allah Azza wa intended it to be this way because this is what they had cho chosen for themselves. So Allah Azza wa whatever happens on this life, Allah Azza wa Jal wants it to be and there are two intention so to speak or judgment from Allah Azza wa Jal. Something that Allah tells us to do and not to do and this is called the, uh, the desire of Allah Azza wa Jal that is related to religion. And there are things that take place regardless whether Allah loves it or not and this is what's taking place in the universe. Universal judgment or something like that. The fourth and last pillar is the pillar, uh, uh, well this was uh, uh, the third, the fourth pillar is the creation. Whatever happens in this universe has been created by Allah Azza wa Jal. But Allah does not create, Allah does not create pure evil. Allah creates the good and the good is attributed to him. And the evil is not attributed to Allah Azza wa Jal, though it was created by him, because there is not any pure evil. Every evil has some good in it. Darkness has good in it because we appreciate light. Illness has good in it because it erases our sins, it elevates us uh, at the side of Allah Azza wa Jal, and it gets us closer to Allah when we supplicate. And the topic needs more elaboration but inshallah this would uh, suffice uh, brother abdul alim from mecca assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum sir how are you alhamdulillah alaikum salam allah actually i belong to asian country and people are uh, going on graveyard asking them to recommend allah for his uh, de uh, whatever is requirement so is it permissible in islam is it jayas to ask on the go on the grave and ask on them okay any more question uh, that's all, sir. Okay, Zakallah khair, brother. Thank you. Re regarding Brother Mahmoud's uh, question on holding the Quran without ablution, it's an issue of dispute among scholars. The majority of scholars say that you should not do that. And they have a number of evidences. The other scholars who do not share their opinion say that these evidences are not clear cut or not authentic. But Either way, as long as the majority of scholars say that you have to be in the state of wudu to hold the Qur'an, it is highly recommended to do this, knowing that ablution by itself is a form of worship and all the sins would come out from your fingernails and from your hair uh, when you perform ablution. Besides, nowadays, alhamdulillah, we have modern technology. 
you can recite the Quran from your mobile, from your laptop, from your computer, from your PDA. All of these means are not considered to be Mus'haf, are not considered to be Quran. So when you hold it, it's okay. There is nothing wrong in that and you don't have to be in the state of uh, purity when you do this. Brother Abdul Alim is asking about some uh, wrong practices that are being done by Muslims in different countries. And unfortunately, this is widespread. Now it's, alhamdulillah, much, much less because knowledge is widespread as well. And people have gone out of being slaves to their scholars, to their saints, to their elders. In the previous years, we've been seeing this enslavement. We've been seeing Muslims being true slaves to their ulama, their scholars. And their scholars are so adamant in keeping them in the loop. And uh, scholars have been trying to keep them in the loop so that they have a good and strong grip uh, on them. But before continuing this question, uh, Sister Fatima from Morocco. Assalamu alaikum. Um, yes, I have an urgent question. Um, it's concerning my menstruation. Um, normally, I have a fairly regular menstruation, which, which comes pretty much on schedule every 26 or 27 days. Um, my, however, my pre previous period came on the 28th day, and it wasn't as heavy as usual, and it didn't have the white discharge at the end. But anyway, I, I waited until there was no more drops of blood, and then I counted it as done. And then one week after that period's end, I got another period, which is my current period, meaning that it has come at least one and a half weeks early. And I checked with the doctor yesterday, and um, perhaps this is due to hormonal imbalances um, or stress. But anyway, the only difference between this current period and the others is the timing, meaning it has the, the normal flow and the feeling of, of the period. So my question is, is it consider, considered my period, even though it's come early? Um, because I've stopped fasting and praying, and am I right in doing so? Is okay, which is okay. So, going back to Brother Abdul Alim's question, nowadays people, alhamdulillah, have been gaining more knowledge due to the fact that modern communication, internet, TV, radio, publications, and people, by their nature, alhamdulillah, they're going back to the basics. No one wants to be enslaved to a scholar who wears a big turban and he tells him do this and don't do that. People would like to learn their religion from the pure words of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Quran, from the pure teachings of the Prophet from the Sunnah. And anything that comes afterwards, it's debatable. But the Quran and Sunnah are not. So nowadays, alhamdulillah, it's much, much less. You see people, ignorant people, going to graves and, and worshipping the graves. Because actually going to the graves, to the saints or to the awliya, and thinking that they hear you and they can convey what you pray or ask of them to Allah Azza wa this is grand shirk. It is completely associating others with Allah. Because Allah says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجَدِ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا That the, the mosques are solely for Allah Azza wa so do not worship others, do not call others with Allah. And if you go to a saint's grave and you tell him, O oh, saint, I have been uh, 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 in debt for the past 10 years, help me, ask Allah to do this for me, this is shirk. This is not, for, uh, not, not permissible at all, even if you do this with the Prophet If you go to the Prophet and ask him for help, this would also be uh, forbidden and it is major shirk. So those who go there, you should warn them. And unfortunately, their scholars are the priests of these saints. They call them to go to the Prophet ﷺ or go to the saint's grave and do this and do that. They claim that the Prophet ﷺ is Hadir Nadir. Wherever you go, he's always with you, alayhi salam, and he's watching over you. Subhanallah, what did you leave for Allah? He is alive in his grave at the moment, like we are alive. He eats and drinks. 
So all of this is nonsense. If he did not die, why did they distribute his inheritance? All of these are wrong practices, wrong beliefs, imposed upon the layman, imposed upon the Muslims by their so-called scholars so they, that they can control them. They can embezzle them from their money, from their income, and they get richer and the mass of the Muslims get more and more ignorant. They kiss their hands, they kiss their feet. What kind of a Muslim would allow this to take place? And they call themselves people of God? They are people of the devil. Abdullah from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Abdullah. Do we still have Brother Abdullah on the line? Probably, probably not. I hope he calls back again, inshallah. Sister Fatima from Morocco, she is in a dilemma. She is used to having her period fixed. And all of a sudden, for one reason or the other, her period changed. And instead of coming on time, she got it a little bit early. And then it was, uh, okay, Abdullah is back on the line. Assalamu alaikum, Abdullah. Hello? Yes, brother. Please, uh, I want to ask about uh, Umrah. I went and make Umrah. Okay. I make Umrah, I make Umrah, then uh, my intention is to make the Umrah for my mother. Okay. Then I came back here before I got shaved of my head. Is it permissible or? Oh, you forgot to shave your head when you came back? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, shave it now. Immediately. I, I have, I have uh, taken off my ihram. Uh, immediately, you're still in the state of ihram. Okay, I'll answer your question, inshallah. Okay, then uh, my, my second question to you is, uh, please, I want to, I want to have, uh, uh, Hajj, I want to take Hajj this, uh, this year. Like, I wanted to have your number after you finish with this catabite, because I want to have some detail about it, so that I'll, before I, I'll go there. So I want to have your number. Later when you finish, I'll call you. I, I believe that the brothers in the control don't have my number, but okay. you can always visit my website and post your question there, inshallah. Ah, okay. Thank okay. you. Jazakallah khair. So, Sister Fatima is saying that the issue of her menses. First of all, we have to know that any blood that the woman sees is considered to be menstruation. So, this is a rule of thumb, providing it does not exceed 15 days. So, if she has a seven days menses and then it stops for five days and then she has another seven days, this is considered to be menstruation. Providing that the total number of days within the month does not exceed 15, which is half of it. So if a woman has, she's regular. All of her life, she used to have her menses six or seven days a month. And all of a sudden, it was prolonged into 14. She should consider these whole 14 days as her menstruation. Likewise, Sister Fatima, because it stopped for a week this means that it was okay for her to pray and to fast. Now, after one week, it came back again. This is her menstruation again. And she, the, the scholars say that there isn't any minimum for the menstruation and there isn't any minimum gap for the purity. So the purity can be one day. You, you could have your purity for one or two days and then you get your menses again. This is possible providing that this does not exceed, as stated before, 15 days a month. Second of all, a lot of the sisters ask and say that I've seen a drop or two of blood. Should I consider this as my menses? And the answer is no. Hayd or menstruation in, in Arabic comes from the linguistically is derived from a, a flood. So you say had al wadi, which means the valley has flooded. So, menstruation is only counted when it gushes, the, the, the blood gushes and it comes in the sort of flow. If it's a drop or two, no, this is not considered to be part of your menses. And, I, uh, and what you have done is, is correct. You should not pray and fast during the times that you're having this uh, uh, menses. And once you're pure, inshallah, you can go back 
uh, to the normal uh, state. Uh, Brother Abdullah is asking about uh, Umrah. This is a common mistake. People make Umrah and because of the amount of people because of the amount of people in the haram and you have to uh, hold the line when you want to shave or, or uh, shorten your hair, they say, okay, why not go back to Jeddah and we would shave there. And they do, but they forget. So they change their clothes, they wash, they shower, they put cologne, they act normal, and then they remember, oh, subhanallah, what have I done? I did not conclude my umrah by shaving or cutting short my hair. So he's asking what, what to do now. The situation is like this. At the moment, you are still in the state of ihram. Sheikh, I have my trousers, my shirt, I've uh, 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 taken a bath, I have put cologne. your ihram garments because you are in ihram so by wearing your shirt and your uh, trousers and your underwears you are making one of the things forbidden for you to do in ihram immediately take them off wear your ihram garments okay sheikh now it's maghrib time maybe uh, i cannot do it now so can i postpone it no you have to do it immediately now you know you have to do it immediately what about the previous days that i have forgotten this well because you have done it out of ignorance there is no expiation, there is no sin, but you immediately have to put on your ihram garment and either go to the barber and get your head shaven or ask your uh, members of the family to shorten all of your hair and by that you would have concluded your umrah. He's also asking about uh, uh, performing hajj and to tell you the truth I forgot the question but nevertheless if he's asking about performing the Hajj, this is a ritual, this is something that is highly recommended. If he's asking about performing Hajj on behalf of others, it's only permissible if he performed Hajj on, on behalf of himself. If he's asking about this Umrah related to Hajj, it is not related to Hajj. So I apologize, but I, uh, I wrote Hajj and I forgot everything about it probably. It's uh, the age. Uh, we have, I think, Sister Nadia from Saudi. Hello, Salaam alaikum. Salaam rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, I have uh, four questions. Inshallah. Uh, number one, uh, my uh, brother, he is going to Switzerland from his office uh, training. So it will be 21st Ramadan, and nine days will be left for Ramadan. So. Is it uh, allowed for him to come back and uh, continue his fasting? His stay is there for 27 days. And during his um, um, uh, training, maybe the Zuhar prayer will be there. So if he cannot, because it's a non-Muslim country, of course there is no system for that. So can he pray at Asr prayer, both prayers together, Zuhar and Asr? And can he eat chicken or anything like that with Ahle Kitab after saying Bismillah? Because of uh, um, non... And what about his Sahar and Aftar? Because there is no uh, ruling about uh, fasting. So just he want to confirm about these things. And my second question is... That was all first question? Uh, so I, I, hello? Yeah, that was all the first question, mashallah. You're asking <laughs> about... Yeah, yeah, that was my first question about uh, his uh, travel to uh, Switzerland. Okay. So, second question is, when we enter uh, the, to the toilet, okay, we say dua. But when we are, uh, after uh, uh, answering the call of nature, when we are doing wudu in the toilet, do we have to say bismillah before wudu, or only in our mind if we say, and without uh, using our tongue, or uh, that dua is enough, uh, what is entering, uh, what is, uh, we are saying for entering the toilet? So, because in the in the toilet, so is it allowed to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Third question. And third question is, uh, if I wash my baby, uh, one year old like that, so do I have to repeat uh, wudu if I am in wudu? My wudu is uh, finished, or I have to I have to wudu again. And 
Fourth question is, uh, my son was asking because he's uh, eight years old and he's confused and he's going to mosque. Some people, when they are going to the sajda, first they sit and go. And some people, they are direct, uh, put the hands on the, on the floor. So what is uh, exactly the correct way to put the hands first or first we have to sit and then go to the sajda? I will, inshallah, answer These questions. These are my four questions. Thanks a lot for your answering. Sister Nadia has a number of long questions, mashallah. Her brother is leaving to Switzerland for 27 days for training uh, of her uh, work. Okay. And uh, she's asking, now he would be traveling on the 21st of uh, Ramadan, and there will be nine days for him. First of all, he is a traveler. So if he wishes not to fast these nine days, it is up to him. This is permissible. Second of all, can he combine Dhuhr to Asr because the training takes place at Dhuhr time and usually they would not allow them, or they would allow them, but people are lazy. Alhamdulillah, you have permission to join Dhuhr, postpone it, and pray it with Asr because you're a traveler and this is a, a, a gift from Allah. However, if you could show the dignity and honor of Islam by saying, excuse me, I have to pray, and go to pray for the sake of Allah and for the sake, inshallah, of calling people to Islam, this would be much, much better than blending in and looking like them, talking like them, doing everything like them, as if you're not a Muslim. What did you do to Islam? But as technicality, yes, it is permissible for you to break your fast. It is permissible for you to uh, combine prayers. About the meat, if they slaughter, then you can eat. If they do not slaughter, and you know that they either uh, electrify or um, bang the animal on the head or they drown it or they suffocate it, this is all forbidden. If you do not know whether they do this or that, it is permissible for you to eat while saying Bismillah. If you do not know if they slaughter or not, because it's a Christian country, it is permissible for you to eat anything, of course, but pork because you don't have any evidence to prove that they do not uh, slaughter. However, I personally would not eat from such food because I'm not going to die. There is seafood, there is veggie, veggie food. So there are so many, and there are Islamic uh, uh, restaurants and Islamic centers where you can get, have halal food. So it is not something, a matter of life and death regarding breaking the fast and uh, making sahur. This can be done with dates. Take a big load of dates with you, and inshallah, uh, things would be easy. She is asking uh, Sister Nadia about, after answering the call of nature, and I would like to perform wudu in the toilet, should I say bismillah before uh, performing ablution verbally, or should I just say it in my heart? Both would do the job, inshallah. And some scholars even say that if you say it verbally, it is permissible. Because the places where we answer the call of nature are not like the places 10 or 15 centuries ago. <clears throat> the Muslims, 15 centuries ago, they did not have toilets, not in their houses. They did not have any place designed or designated to answer the call of nature. They used to go outside the skirts of the, the village or the town into the wilderness and they would answer the call of nature there. Therefore, that place would most likely be inhabited by jinn, by devils. And it's a place of impurities. And that is why mentioning the name of Allah in such places would not be recommended to honor and purify the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. If you look at nowadays toilets, it's a different issue because the toilets are so clean, the water is running, you do not see any impurities in front of you, it's all gone down the drain. So the actual place is not as dirty as it used to be or as filthy as it used to be. So some scholars say that it is permissible to say verbally, Bismillah, and if you just move your lips with it, that would suffice, inshallah. And... Uh, her third question, she is she's asking about her one-year-old child. And she, she says that whenever she washes the child, 
uh, and she is in the state of purity. So does she have to perform wudu again? And the reason she is asking this because there is a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever touches his private parts or someone else's private parts, he must perform wudu. And scholars have different opinion regarding whether this is authentic or not. However, in the case of a mother, she is frequently asked to do this action a number of times per day. And it would be extremely difficult for her to do this and that. And therefore, the scholars say, when you wash your child, when you touch your child's private parts, this does not invalidate your wudu. And the last question before we break, uh, uh, her son is confused. People, when they prostrate, some of them in, in tilawa, recitation prostration, while in prayer, instead of going directly to prostration, they sit first as if in the tashahud position and then they perform uh, their prostration. This is wrong. The right thing to do is to fall on your hands and knees in prostration, not to sit first and then offer your uh, prostration. And I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. Until we meet you tomorrow, inshallah, at the same time, an hour earlier. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest.